Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Simply Nerdy. I'm your host, Stephen. I'm joined today by a very special panel. We have um, Austin from our uh, normal panel. And then we have three guests with us today. We have Jack. Oh, hey, everyone. We have Alex. And we have <laughs> Justin. <laughs> Justin Coons. Thank you so much for coming on the show with us. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, we are here to, to interview him because he is an amazing artist. Um, he's got an, a very impressive background. I'm just going to let him introduce himself um, for all of us. Um, so, Justin, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and share some of your earliest influences and inspirations that led you to pursue a career in art? You bet. Can, um, yeah, if you can pull up the slides, I, I can show images because I'm an illustrator, an artist, and I like to show pictures and look at them together. So that's how you spell my name. And th I got my website and I'm on Facebook and Instagram. But uh, Stephen, I put this image up first for you because I thought you might appreciate the cabin in the tree. Love it. I do. Absolutely. And, and if, if we get to the <laughs> end, the, I, I can tell you a little bit more about this image and what, what it's related to. So Ooh, I'm intrigued. <laughs> for those okay. of you that do not know, we are actually cousins. So yes. just throwing that out there. Uh, just some snapshots of my family because they're more interesting than I am. This is about 14 years ago when they were little. I can't believe how fast time goes by when we lived in California. Uh, this is our Halloween costume as a family. We decided to go Harry Potter characters. So you can see little Ron Weasley there and Hermione and Harry. <laughs> and then love it. I think I was Dumbledore, but I didn't have the beard. <laughs> <laughs> we have two boys, two girls. Um, and that's this is about seven years ago, so we're kind of fast forwarding. This is in 2020, so they're all kind of becoming adults now. And then this is just about a year and a half ago in the fall. I don't have a more recent picture, but man, you know, Josh had a haircut, so he doesn't have the locks anymore. Pretty much the same as we did. Then. So, I, I, this is, I have to share my artist origin story. I know it's not as cool as a superhero origin story, but you Same get thing. what you get. So this is my <laughs> first day of public school, <laughs> off to kindergarten. And you notice I'm wearing a BYU Cougars t-shirt. And my backpack resembles a Crayola crayon box. Oh, that's so awesome. I think, that's and now, I, now I'm a professor of illustration at BYU. I actually went to BYU for my degree in illustration, and now I became a professor. So there's something about this picture that I think is at least foreshadowing, if not predictive or, or prophetic in a way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so some of my earliest influences, you know, growing up Latter-day Saint uh, in the church, you know, I saw these paintings, these kind of European artists that the church was using in the publications. And I just thought this was sort of phenomenal. You know, to me, this was amazing, right? Um, these paintings. All, we also had in the church a lot of um, illustrations and, and paintings by... You know, 20th century illustrators showing you know scenes from scriptures again huge influence on me it just this stuff just blew me away you know when i when i really started to appreciate what these artists accomplished with this kind of work right i also uh you know if if, if you grew up in the 80s you probably were familiar with norman rockwell but um western art was was a thing i actually had a neighbor who owned a car dealership and they had some money and so they had some original art in their home and they actually had a full scale charcoal drawing of this very Norman Rockwell piece. Man. Cause Rockwell would do uh, charcoal before he did the painting, right? And so I guess they bought it at, at auction or something like that, but they had the original there, the charcoal, not the painting. And that just blew me away, you know, seeing that in real life. And they had this kind of Western art also. So this kind of thing was an influence. And then of course, growing up in the eighties. Oh yeah. Steven, I don't know if you were born yet, but no, nope. I remember. I don't remember seeing the first <laughs> Star Wars movie in the theaters, but I do have a memory of watching Empire Strikes Back, that opening sequence in, in the Planet Hoth. I must have been five years old, and I was just totally flabbergasted by all that. So huge influence, obviously. ET, you know, almost a traumatic experience watching this movie when I was like six years old, seven years old, maybe eight. I might have been eight when it came out. And then, of course, Star Wars. We lined up for this one. You know, I I almost made it through without having to go to the bathroom. 
<laughs> every time, man. I swear. I, I, was, every I, was, time. I was eight years old. I drink a lot of soda. You know, it's a long yeah. movie, but it was amazing. Um, and things like this, very fantasy, you know, in the 80s, never ending story, the dark crystal. So these kinds of yeah, like oh, yeah. Yeah. highly imaginative things. Um, you know, the, with the, uh, I don't know, there's so much detail and even the, like the puppeteering and stuff yeah. Oh, absolutely. compared to, yeah. compared to things Crazy. nowadays with CGI. It's just not the same. Yeah. Right. And when you're a kid, you watch those gel things and you don't really know if they're puppets or they're real. I remember, right? you know, I was like six years old, seven, something like watching that and going, I don't even know what I'm watching. You know, I it just, mm -hmm. it was amazing to me. Right. It was that realistic. And then, of course, adventure movies like the Goonies. And I started to become aware of the, the poster art. That's why I included it here. Drew Struzan and others, um, but especially Struzan, he was just legendary. I mean, he he illustrated all the, the major movies, the, the big popcorn movies, the summer movies, right? And I would stand in the movie theater in the lobby and just marvel at these big illustrations, these posters, and thinking, you know, somebody drew that. Somebody painted it, right? Oh, yeah. So these were kind of the big movies in the 80s. Um, I had a teacher who introduced our class to these books, the series. And this really hooked me too. I wasn't really a reader before this, but there was something about this um, fantasy world that was really fascinating to me, you know? Uh, my brothers had had these books. I don't know if they really played D&D. &D. <laughs> 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 but I would pull these out and, and try to figure out how to play the game. I didn't have anybody, anybody to teach me. And I just, I just got hooked on the art and just so mm -hmm. interested in it, I would just go draw pictures. So I never really played D&D &D growing up, but I did take a lot of inspiration from the fantasy art. This was one of the first computer games. We had a PC that my dad got. He worked for IBM. He was a salesman. So when I was about eight years old, 1983, we got a PC and my brothers got this game and I was like, what is this? It's awesome. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and this is the graphics. This is what it looked like. Oh, man. <laughs> retro <laughs> but it was still cool back then right like you had to use your imagination right but you know you you go from this this is like the cover and you had all these spell books and everything and then you load up the game and it's like dude 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 you know yeah, they like really had to talk and... up the concept art in those games yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was more like here look at these look at these booklets they'll, they'll give you an idea what it's supposed to look like right <laughs> <laughs> But you know, further um, in junior high, you know, I discovered the, the these Shannara books, and I wasn't a very good reader, so these were kind of long and detailed, and I don't know if I ever got through them, but I was super interested. Um, Hill, the Hildebrands, the kind of like sort of realistic um, fantasy artwork, is fascinating to me. Daryl Sweet, uh, and a lot of these are for games or book covers, um, and I love the sort of nature. So I loved uh, I loved the Princess Bride, you guys. This movie. I do too. It's, it's a classic. classic. It really never die. I quote yeah. it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's sort of in this fantasy adventure genre that, and it was just so fun and like comedy and like so much heart, you know. So influences um, comic books. I started discovering the comic book store in my oh, town. Man. I grew up in Bountiful, and I would blow all my spending money on comics. Um, you know, this is about seventh, eighth, ninth grade. X Men. Akira um, really blew me away when I when I encountered that. I was like, "What is this?" Because I wasn't familiar, very familiar with Japanese art or comics or animation. It wasn't as prevalent then as it is now. Um, so when I saw these on the shelves, and I just like, it was sci-fi. It was futuristic. It was kind of violent and gory. You know, <laughs> and just like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But so well drawn, like beautifully drawn. Yeah. About that time too, you start. We started seeing these uh, early computer graphics things, right? Like Pixar, um, the ballroom scene here on Beauty and the Beast was 3D, you know. And I was like, "What is this?" You know, it it was. I could tell it wasn't f photography, but it was no, it wasn't drawn. You, I mean, it was. I understood these were done with computers, and I was like, "I'm really interested in that," you know. I also in high school started becoming aware of sort of the famous illustrators and Renaissance artists like Michelangelo and, and just marveling at what they accomplished. Right. So Arthur Rackham, NC Wyeth, just wow. beautiful stuff. Um, I think I was a senior in high school when I, when I went to the library, I started going to the library and looking at art books just to sort of expose my mind to more inspiration. And I saw this painting by John William Waterhouse 
And it just totally blew me away. Like, I still think this is a perfect painting, you know? Like, I don't know how you could make this painting better. Maybe, maybe dragons. I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, Edwin Austin Abbey, similar kind of genre, but sort of that medieval um, fantasy thing was just so interesting and, and colorful and beautiful, you know, in, in an illustration, right? Mm -hmm. So I went to BYU to study illustration and I had really remarkable faculty very, who were very influential on me. And I just loved the attention to drawing and storytelling, color, design, you know? And so that started to open up a whole world of possibilities to me, um, being able to study with people like James Christensen. I only had one class from him, but it, he really had an impact on me because it was it was this sort of fantasy worlds that he was creating and it was so narrative. I mean, he was working in all this sort of mythology and poetry, you know, romantic poetry and all these things that sort of inspired his work. And it just, he was so successful and I just thought, this is amazing, you know, the possibilities of what art can can do and be, you know. This is some of my work that I did as a student early, you know, early in the illustration program. I had served a mission in Japan, so I was really interested in all things Japanese. Nice. And then I don't know where this little mime dog came from. He was sort of like a sketch in my sketchbook. <laughs> and I'm like, what That's is awesome. this guy? You know? So I did <laughs> this, this sort of sad looking mime dog. And I actually got in a student competition, the Society of Illustrators student competition with that painting. Surprise. Oh, wow. That was fun. <laughs> Didn't I didn't win any money, but I got published, you know. Thanks. Um, Thanks. But I did I did get a job at the Daily Universe, the BYU newspaper, as a graphic artist. So these were editorial illustrations just drawn with charcoal. Um, wow. Usually in just in a couple, maybe three hours for one of these, two or three hours, because we had deadlines to meet, you know. So I was trying to create something every day for the newspaper, if possible. This was sort of a Halloween theme, just playing with scale. Um all things sort of spooky, you know. That's neat. Yeah. And I really fell in love with um, just drawing from the live model and painting from the live model. So, you know, th these aren't like, you know, finished illustrations, but this these are examples of paintings and, and drawings done from live model sittings. And, and I, it was that kind of thing where it really helps you focus and, and develop your drawing skills and your design, your sense of design and aesthetics and understanding form and, and light and color and things like that. So that, that experience was really influential to me. Just, just realizing what I'm what I'm capable of. Right. So trying to apply those things to paintings and, you know, I was doing sort of the really pretty and beautiful and cute things, but also sort of dark and spooky things. This piece on the right um, is an illustration from, uh, I think it was a uh, Agatha Christie short story. It's been a long time, <laughs> but these, no worries. Like, these sort of terrifying stories. So, you know, um, people see this women hated, you know, young women hated this painting because you see this sort of terrifying guy hiding in the closet. Right. Just as <laughs> yeah. safe, locking her door. So, you know, it, the idea is to kind of like playing with emotions and kind of um, what kind of experience you can give people. About the time I graduated, my sister was a, uh, she was a theater major and she was putting on some some small time sort of plays in New York. I think she did one, two summers in a row. And I I volunteered to do the illustrations for her poster to advertise the play. And uh, I got sort of these po postcards out of it. They gave me the extra postcards that they had printed. And in those days, it wasn't that cheap to print postcards. So I was like, I'll take them. But this is an, sort of an experimental style with a, a, a brush and, and ink to kind of go more loose loose and sketchy kind of more for drama kind of thing right but you know i come back to sort of fantasy and character design this was these were characters and designs for my bfa final project my capstone project um i decided to illustrate the chronicles of Perdain, the books i showed you that i was introduced yeah to. yeah and uh just trying to imagine what those characters looked like and and it's been interesting to see the sort of connections because there's people who love these books who you know there's not a lot of artwork created based on these books and so when i put them up on the internet like in 1999 when i did them i started making connections with people who were fans because they would discover them you know by doing searches and even now if you search like chronicles of perdain art or whatever you'll see most you know you'll see a lot of these things show up on the internet that's amazing and those are 
those are just so well detailed. Sorry, thinking oh. about those. Like they're they got a lot of character just in each person. Yeah, yeah, very well done. Well, it was part of it was practicing like just drawing the head, you know, because these are all drawn from imagination. I, these were not using models, so I'm you know trying to use the my knowledge of the structure of the head and then make a character out of it, right? Like you decide if it's male or female, how old. You know, and then the sort of particular characteristics, do they have a big nose? Are they skinny? Are they fat? Do they have a beard? You know, do they have long hair. You know, um, there's a dwarf in there, right? Like, and so you're mm -hmm. kind of, you know, there's a zombie character, you know, the cauldron born. So you're kind of playing with proportions and features and things like that. And a lot of them are rough and sketchy and unfinished, but it's it's concept art, right? You're sort mm -hmm. of right. developing yeah. the character. So that Love was it. formative for me. These are the paintings that I did for book covers for that series, right? So this is just still student work, technically. Um, and there's five books. So the Book of Three, The Black Cauldron. These were not just from imagination. I, I got models and costumes and set things up the way you're supposed to as an illustrator. Mm. But I was still kind of figuring out my process. And, you know, these aren't everything they could be, obviously. But wait a second. Oh, this is the one I didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I was just thinking, you did the pick art meme. <laughs> I, I set out to do five, <laughs> five paintings for five books, but I I ran out of time, and that one just didn't come together. So unfortunately, <laughs> it's hard. You know, these things take a lot of time. So anyway, for sure, absolutely. So so that's kind of my background, formative years, early work. Um, it's good to get that out of the way. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought this slide up, Coins and Medals, because I wanted to say congratulations on getting your design selected for both sides of the uh, Ghost Army Congressional Gold Medal. Thank uh, you. Um, it's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and your process for designing those medals? You bet. So this is these are the designs Dang. I think you were talking about. Um, yes. You know, going, going back, I've, I've been doing coin and metal designs for the United States Mint since about 2004. I just heard about this opportunity on the news. There was a press release, I guess, that the Mint had put out that they were looking for artists, not to work full time at the Mint, but kind of to enter a contractor pool where they would okay. give give us sort of design commissions or assignments as sort of like a non-employee, right? But a, a freelancer, basically. Right. And I was like, well, that sounds awesome, you know? <laughs> so I applied and I was accepted into the program. It's called the Artistic Infusion Program. So... I, you know, I've been doing that off and on for, you know, 20 years almost, right? I mean, I, have, I had a hiatus in there for a little while, but I've had a lot the opportunity, I'll show you some of them, the opportunity to submit designs for a whole lot of coins and medals. I'm sure over 100. I haven't ever sat down and, and added it up, but I'll do, I typically have done like five or 10 or more a year Man. for like, you know, the last 17 out, or eight, 16 or 17 out of the last 20 years. So I'm, I'm probably up in the 160 designs submitted kind of category, 150, something like that, maybe Jeez. more. I but no idea. I had about 20 minted, and I'll, I can show most of those here. I mean, if you count like both sides. So I count this as two because actually both oh, sides yeah. the medal. This is kind of how they turn out in, in, in bronze. It's a congressional gold medal, but they also make a bronze three inch and a bronze one and a half inch. So those can be purchased at the mint. And that's what helps fund, you know, paying for the gold the medal that they award to the recipients. So BYU nice. did an article about this uh, in a video that was pretty cool. With yeah, it was awesome. About the experience. So um, there's, there's articles if people want to read more about that. But the Ghost Army was basically, they are part of the army, but um, they were in Europe and they were not actually a fighting unit necessarily. I mean, they were prepared to defend themselves, but their goal was to um, sort of create visual and auditory and tactical deception to kind of throw off the enemy, to, to send the, the Germans in the wrong direction, to, to basically protect um, US troops. And it, it worked incredibly well. And so it was classified, of course, and it was it remained classified for something like 70 years after the war, maybe not that long, 50 years or something. Um, so they didn't really get much recognition because they couldn't even talk about their work. you know. Mm -hmm. And these were really creative people. A lot of them were artists and dramatic people. And you know they just had, these talents, they, they could make things. So in the metal, you see them kind of carrying this inflatable tank in the background that represents the visual deceptions. The auditory deceptions were sort of these pre-recorded sounds, like the sounds of uh, tanks rolling in or, or bridges being built or whatever, right? M military sounds. They also would sew patches, like, you know, different patches on their uniforms, and then they'd go into town and 
the locals would would you know report oh you know such and such a company and unit is here but they were just fake they were just actors basically <laughs> they would go to the pubs and sort of pretend to have loose lips and talk about things that were going on because they they figured there were sort of spies there and it was all fiction that you know it was all staged basically it wasn't really accurate they were just sowing uh, sort of misinformation into the enemies um into the enemy's network and and so also even like these um morse code transmissions there was just fake communiques that were meant to throw off throw them off the trail of the real units so really creative bold you know adventurous kind of things these are their um patch units and so yeah the, i mean the process of that i mean i don't have my thumbnail sketches in this but i do a lot of thumbnail sketches small you know two one inch three inch sketches in my sketchbook really rough just trying to figure out the design the composition and then i usually get costumes but in this case um I just had these guys pose. This is my brother-in-law. <laughs> and so, That's awesome. The, you know, this is in Minnesota, and this is just our hotel room, and they're, like, moving the couch around like it's an inflatable tank and, like, pantomiming, <laughs> throwing the patch on. You know, I, I put my head nice. on and had them do, like, the most code thing, but with a mouse, you know. Like, <laughs> but, you know, this is the kind of reference that's really helpful to have because it makes it so I don't have to invent everything. I can get the folds of that shirt looking right, you know, and maybe the – the profile um yeah these these are my wife's brothers two younger brothers one of them actually is in the army so anyway um so this is them pantomiming carrying that tank and that that helps me get the sketches you know um and then that half track that i just happened to go to a thing in here in orem where they had military units on display and so they had this half track and i got to photograph that for reference and kind of do a sketch of it and then i also build some 3d models so this speaker unit is based on historical photos and i just built that in maya and rendered it and kind of used that for my reference this was uh the inflatable tank this is the model i, I actually sculpted this in zbrush so if you're familiar with that because i wanted it to look a little squishy you know like like fabric and and to get the sort of subtle um folds in there so that's that's all 3d model sculpted and that, that helps me kind of draw it more convincingly if i can sculpt it first Man. These are the patch emblems, emblems uh, in relief. So I, I've, I can model these in, in Maya so that they're 3D. You know, Maya is a common, if, for those who aren't familiar, it's a common 3D software package that's used for video games and movies. So I have familiar with that having, a familiarity with Maya having worked on it for years in the game industry. So when it's appropriate like this is a good time to kind of like use those, those skills from the game industry. So anyway, that's that metal. Um, this is one of the first ones I did one of the, this is the first one I think that was minted. Wow. Dang. This is the reverse. Cool. This was for Andrew Jackson. This was the first spouse gold coin program. And Jackson was a widower when he was a president. So they just have the Lady Liberty on the obverse side. And then they had this, they, they would have images emblematic of their presidency. And this, you know, he I think it was the War of 1812. He was called Old Hickory. And that kind of became his nickname. So I did this design. Um Abraham Lincoln, a bicentennial coin in 2009, was minted. This one was a uh, civil rights, uh, 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Congressional gold medals for the code talkers from different tribes. Uh, the, the Lakota or the Rosebud Sioux tribe. Aquasasne Mohawk tribe. Some of their um, clan animals. American Liberty gold coin. Um, Shawnee National Forest. Camel Rock is the name of that rock formation, and, and that's a red-tailed hawk. Uh, this was uh, another American Liberty coin. This is actually was in the news because it was sort of the first representation of Lady Liberty as an African-American woman, so that was newsworthy at the time. This is a series of platinum coins based on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This was really exciting because this these were designs were done. I did these as a kind of a series. They selected the series you know, to mint all three of them in 2018, 19, and 2020 as platinum coins. It just kind of shows the sort of life cycle, right? And the first one, she's planting and teaching her baby how to plant, you know, and then the second one, it kind of shows the expansion and the the, the torch of freedom and, you know, the law, you know, the, the book kind of represents the, the, um, the law and the constitution that upholds our liberties. And then, you know, the third one, the pursuit of happiness, it's like the harvest, right? And so, you know, I, I've, I came up with that idea of chasing a butterfly, a child chasing a butterfly. 
you know, her baby is a little bit older now, and and then now the next generation is trying to pursue happiness, right? That idea is that the butterfly is a little just out of reach all the time. You just can't catch a butterfly with your bare hands. You know? <laughs> That's the pursuit, right? That's the pursuit portion. Right? That's the pursuit that we're talking about. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. This was Dang. for the Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, they did a series of coins, I think, in gold, silver, and clad. I don't know if there was a platinum one. But it was fun because I got to go to the Hall of Fame during the um, induction ceremony and go get up on the stage and, and unveil a, a giant you know, printout of the coin. And I got to meet, like, Larry Bird and Charles Barkley and, you know, what That's amazing yeah. when wow. when they when they had, uh, minted the coin and they did the first strike ceremony i went out to philadelphia and dr j gave a um, kind of a, a speech about it and he he gave me a shout out and had me stand up and get applause from the whole group there. <laughs> it was awesome dang weir farm this is uh america the beautiful you know the, this this series celebrates the kind of like national parks and uh national monuments i think we're, uh, Jay Alden Weir was an artist, and uh, they have a this farm that he developed that he owned, where it was kind of like almost like Disneyland for artists, I guess. <laughs> uh, this this is part of the American Innovation Coin Series, one dollar coins. So this is my Statue of Liberty design, and it's actually on, on all the coins in this series for sixteen years. So every, every coin is going to have my design on it. Wow. wow. Um, I got one of the reverses. So this is a coin that actually will have my design on both sides that does have it on both sides because like it has th that one and then this one on the other side. This is for South Carolina, Septima Clark. She taught people to read so that they could um, understand their rights in the, and read the Constitution and be able to vote and that kind of thing. So that's wow. pretty cool. Uh, Vermont innovated snowboarding. I guess snowboarding was invented in Vermont. So that's the theme we went with on that design. But yeah, that's the highlights of the coins and medals. There might be a couple that I forgot, but that's most of the ones that have been minted. Well, those are incredible. I've been uh, real. mostly silent this whole time, just taking it in, but man. There's a lot of over. images. I'm trying to move quick. because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. It's like I've got a 25-year career, and I've done a lot of art, and so I want to... Absolutely. You want to highlight all of it. Share some of that, the highlights anyway. Going to have to find some of those coins. <laughs> for real ebay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so justin uh yes. can you tell us a little bit about your time as a senior artist at blizzard entertainment yeah um i was there five and a half years ish from uh about 2006 middle of 2006 to the end of 2011 I guess I can go back before that a little bit, but here's kind of the games I'm credited on. You see a lot of Blizzard titles there, but I didn't start at Blizzard. I started a small studio in Utah called Sapphire. They're mm -hmm. not around anymore. And then I went, that was kind of like, it was a job, but it felt like an internship. You know what I mean? The way the, way the company was sort of run. <laughs> see guys, I told you he did Lego Bionicle. I was right. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then I went to uh, Avalanche, uh, and I think there was a Rugrats game that I didn't put in this list that I worked on too. So you might, if you go up to like Moby Games and look at my profile there, you'll probably see that credit. But I didn't do that much on that game, I don't think. Anyway, yeah, we did a Tack and the Power of Juju, you know, and a couple of sequels for that for THQ. Dragon Ball Z Sagas, that was an adventure to work on that game. Mm -hmm. And then we did some a couple of games for Disney. I, I worked on Chicken Little, and we did a sequel. To Chicken Little, let me show let me show you these. This is more fun. Um, we did our own sequel to Chicken Little called Ace in Action. Even though the movie didn't didn't have a sequel, we did a sequel to the video game. Wow! <laughs> and it was actually a fun <laughs> game. Awesome. It got something like it got like a seven point something uh, score with with the critics on uh, what's what is what's the game website that does the reviews? I can't remember. Uh, IGN, IGN or yeah, it was one of those one of those, and which is a surprisingly good rating. I mean, the review was like. Wow, I didn't expect this to be real, actually a fun game, but it was super fun, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I right, actually left even... before that game was over, and I went to Blizzard. I got I got recruited to Blizzard, you guys. It was so cool. It was like That's such amazing. a like, wonderful part of my life because I was already a big fan of Warcraft three, and I had not started playing World of Warcraft because I didn't want to get hopelessly addicted. I was kind of like, <laughs> avoiding, <laughs> avoiding that, <laughs> but then I just kind of. I well, I didn't get hopelessly addicted, but I did start to play it when I started working at Blizzard. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, um, senior 3D artist 
on the World of Warcraft team, the environment team specifically. Um, when I started, we were just finishing up the Burning Crusade. I got to be there for the entirety of Wrath of the Lich King and Cataclysm. And then most of Mists of Pandaria, I kind of left before Pandaria was done. And, and I went to BYU to, you know, was offered to a position on the faculty. So I didn't stick around to finish Mists of Pandaria, which makes me a little bit sad because I was loving that game. But I felt like it was time to go. And then I've, I've done some kind of freelance work for a couple of their games since then. But that's sort of my background. But I'll tell you more about, I mean, I have a whole section on Blizzard, so I'll get to that in a second. But I think you wanted to know a little bit about the process. I absolutely did. I'm sorry to jump ahead of this. but No, no, go ahead. Go. I mean, most people, I mean, I'm not going to detail the whole game development process because you'd be bored and I'd get a lot of things wrong because... I've been out of it for like 12 years, but when I, when I worked in games, um, my, as far as I was concerned, like the art was the thing I was worried about, right? That was my job. <laughs> so concept art, you've heard of this, and this is really just trying to, you're trying to nail down a unique look and feel for your game so that it doesn't look like every other game, right? Because that's part of the, the branding and the identification and what makes the game special. So concept art is a big part of that. It makes, that's what makes the game feel unique and original when you play it even if the gameplay is similar to other games you got to have art that's unique right it starts with concept art that's these and i'll show you a lot of that these are the characters and environments that we, that we designed that we designed by drawing and painting them before we ever built them in 3d um the actual game design you know what is the game what's the gameplay all this stuff i didn't do much of that sometimes i do i would do maps or i would do little quick write-ups or suggestions but i wasn't a game designer so i didn't have to worry about how to make the game fun. That was somebody else's job. You know, my job was to make it look good, which, you know, I was happy with that because it's enough of not enough pressure to do do the art. I couldn't imagine like having the pressure to uh, make the game really fun. Right. And balance it. And yeah. balance. Yeah, everybody's it. yelling at you and you're the best. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this about Blizzard. It was awesome to work at a company that really put gameplay first, that had really excellent game designers and that they really knew if the game was fun or not. Like they were, I mean, when I was there, at least, I can't speak to the current, current situation, but people really would not settle for a game that was not fun, right? Like Blizzard just would not do that, right, in, in that time. And so that gave me a lot of confidence, confidence as an artist that like I can put my best efforts into the art because I don't have to worry about, is this game going to be fun? I just know it'll be fun because Blizzard would make that happen, you know, the team's... Absolutely. And so that, that was an exciting place to be an artist because you're like, you're just trying to make art that's worthy of that a game that's that much fun, right? That's that's that compelling. You want the art to be as compelling as the game, right? So environment art, you know, once we kind of get the concepts figured out, we got to start map, you know, laying out the maps. And, and I did a lot of terrain textures. I have a few of those in this slides, but if I showed you those, we'd be here all night because I did so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you would play well, you might recognize them because they're on the ground. And whenever you're outside, you're running around and you would have seen those things on the ground. Um, maybe you even took a minute to look at them. I don't know. 3D objects. This is just like the trees, the vertical things, right? The things that sit on the ground, right? Structures, um, props, all the little things that fill a room or fill a campsite, you know, little details that make up the world. And even the sky, you know, I'm going to show you some of those. I would do the skies and lighting and fog, just kind of everything in the environment you know not so much structures we had a whole team that would would build the like the architecture the buildings right mm -hmm. and and sometimes the concept i would do would would sort of hint at that but it, but we had other artists who would really delve into the buildings right so you'll see in my concepts some of the buildings are sort of placeholder they're not really how they ended up looking but i just put the building there to kind of give it scale and right to get to get the ball rolling a little bit right Character art. This was not really my domain. I got to do a little bit of characters, just dabbling when when they needed more help, um, at least for on the concept side. And then also some weapons. I got to make some art, some weapons and items that, that I'll show you a few of those. That was a lot of fun. Oh, fun. Too. The environment arts. We had to have our work done before everybody else because you can't really finish the game unless you have the environment done first. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> you, absolutely. You keep adding things in into the game, but the environment kind of has to be done first so so when we would finish our work then we would jump onto this you know and help out with the other teams and do these weapons and armor things right and even heads up display things um all the all games should be tested <laughs> you know some <laughs> 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 
but every game deserves to be tested and blizzard takes that very seriously and so we would get um we'd get a lot of bugs you know most of those were programming and, and design bugs but we would also get art bugs you know collision issues where you can walk right through a wall or a tree weird stuff happening to textures or whatever and or physics yeah physics things yep. yeah so um but most of them visual issues you know that would get sorted into you know what whatever something we needed to fix or if that was a graphics programming issue and occasionally not so much at blizzard but because they had their own team dedicated for you know creating the artwork for marketing but a lot of times they would just use the concept art um i was told too that you know they would have used more of my concept art for this purpose um but i the resolution was too low because i i wasn't thinking you know that they would want to print it out like seven feet high by 12 feet wide <laughs> oh, <Whoa>. <laughs> and they're like yeah we want it we wanted to put a, put your work on a wall, but the resolution wouldn't let us do it. It, it didn't look good at that scale. And I'm like, yeah, because I painted on this PC. And if you got me a faster PC and told me that it needed to be big, then I probably could have it big. But <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <Dang it. laughs> I'm, I was just trying to get the art to the team to kind of have a discussion about it. That's because concept art, you're, concept art, you're not really thinking, this is going to be it shown at BlizzCon, you know, on a giant display, you know. You're just like, I got to get this in time for the meeting on Tuesday so they can decide what, what we're going to do, you know? Anyway, so that's kind of the explanation. This kind of, I'm going to rewind a little bit. This is my first game job doing, um, these were actually like Game Boy games, Rune Lords. And we did a, a Hobbit for, um, I think, Game Boy Advance. So these are some concept sketches for characters. This was before any of the movies came out. This is like probably 2000, 2001. And so the I was just going from the books, you know, with my my character designs man mike gandalf That's is a really little good. more of a cowboy like with the boots and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he's not like this sort of like frail wizard you know what I'm he's, he's an adventure he's a ranger thing. they should bring that version in next yeah. that's, that's right let's go but i was surprised how similar the golem in the movies was to my sketch i think they might have seen this just kidding i don't know but i picture he would have like really long fingernails um and and like webbed webbed fingers because he's been living in that kind of watery cave environment for so long and and really like big eyes like like you'd have if you lived in a cave right mm -hmm. yeah, um, absolutely these are costume designs I'll, I'll start to go a little faster through these this was for like kind of like a cloak and dagger spy game where they they would go to the future and they would go you know in space and these were sort of like buzz lightyear inspired but a little more grown up um, these were early concepts for Attack and the Power of Juju, just figuring out the characters. This was a more lighthearted, whimsical game. You know, a lot of humor and and this kind of like goofy characters. None of these characters made the final cut. I don't know why, but... Um, <laughs> those look so yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a concept art. You do things and they're just like fun and it's like, okay, we're not going to do that, but cool drawing, bro. You know, like... <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like oh, thanks. Nice try. At least I got paid, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to get paid to draw pictures. So th these are some color studies from Chicken Little Ace in Action. You know, the idea was that if you've ever seen the movie, there's a that final scene where they're like going to watch a movie about their their experiences, but it's very Hollywood. And so Chicken Little is this sort of buff, you know, guy in the movie, you know, just totally different from the real Chicken Little. And they're fighting this sort of like galactic battle in the solar system. And, you know, you know so in, in our in our game, we just took that idea and ran with it. And, you know, the secret base is like hidden inside the moon. If you go to the, the back side of the moon, there's this crater that opens up like the Death Star and you can go inside <laughs> the moon. There's a little planetoid inside the moon and it's really polluted. And anyway, these are the ideas that we had. Uh, Saturn was supposed to be this, you know, like gas giant, right? Where these these floating cities on giant um, platforms. Um, so there's some concept for that. And obviously, it's sort of inspired by Star Wars and other sort of pulp sci-fi yeah, I was gonna say, was gonna yeah, say Cloud like, City yeah. a little bit, right? Cloud City. <laughs> and what we're doing, we were kind of like satirizing or, or spoofing science fiction a little bit in this game, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we would definitely kind of borrow things from uh, from the great science fiction. That so this is more like at the street level on that float, floating city. Everything I fi Dude. figure had to kind of look like fins or wings of an airplane, so it could be aerodynamic. Um, a little bit wonky perspective. This is Mars, you know, the, the greenhouse on Mars. So it's kind of like the 1950s idea of Mars, not 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 the reality of Mars, right? And these are some textures on the 3D models. So the, those weird vegetables on Mars, just kind of showing how the texture goes onto the 3D. 
And, and a lot of what I would do is hand paint the textures, right? So you see some kind of those Mars terrain up there. The lower row here is kind of like metal things from Pluto. Pluto is this ice planet that's sort of a prison. You know, the whole thing is nice. a prison kind of thing. Nice. And, um, you'll see that that second texture on the bottom. You'll, you'll see that in a minute on a, on a little spacecraft kind of thing. And lava, mushrooms, those these are necessities. You don't have a video game if you don't have lava and mushrooms, I think. <laughs> you, I mean, you you're not have, wrong. Yeah. You're not wrong, there. More examples of just the, how the concept then go to, kind of trickles down to textures and then specific objects. They're kind of all tying back to the color palette, the things that showed up in the concept. We want to kind of like develop those, right? So that that upper left or upper left texture is kind of a conceptual texture, but then you would we would break it into smaller pieces so it could be used to put on 3D geometry, and kind of build out the things. Mm -hmm. This was uh, the little sort of cop car on the Pluto planet. Kind of looks like a Boston Terrier. Yeah. Also, also looks <laughs> oh, like yeah. snow speeders from Empire Strikes Back. So that was yep. the idea, like mashing those up. That's awesome. Um, there's the texture, <laughs> the 3D model. So I painted the texture, another artist did the 3D model, actually, and then another artist did the sort of line drawing from this, and then I did the paint on it. So it's, I have, can't take credit for the idea. It was Sam Nielsen was the artist who came up with the idea, but I, I'm a sort of a painter. So I got to kind of paint the concept and the textures for this thing. And I went a little hog wild on the underside of it. And, I, and then I, I never even stopped to ask whether the player would ever see the bottom of it. You know, and I'm like, I gotta have engine parts under there and make it really, grungy and cool anyway nice <laughs> i was just having fun with that this is a sort of a this is from going back to tack in the power of juju this is just like a character that i'm yeah. yeah it's awesome these are concepts um again we were doing a game based on meet the robinsons but again like we would do we would try to extend it beyond that world so my idea was this these are future meet the robinsons so these are based on characters that were kids in the movie who had like a science project and in the future, they've become these like super villains, you know. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> the theme of their 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 super villainy is like based on the science project they had. So the girl who had like the ant farm, she becomes like this queen of all the ants, basically, you know, <laughs> you know, mind controlling ants. Anyway, th these were a little bit edgy. These got, got rejected too. Hmm. They were like a little edgy for a kids game. These were part of a game that was never finished either. <laughs> But I really like these drawings, and I'm actually working on a project now where I'm kind of looking back at these, trying to kind of um, borrow some of the style. Foreshadowing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, th this game was actually called the Jabberwocky. It was going to be based on Lewis Carroll's poem and everything. Um, nice. And and they went on. I I left the company before this really got underway. I was just doing early concepts for it, but they they spent a lot of time and effort on it, and then um, Disney canceled it. Canceled the project. Oh. I don't understand. Aww. Just how it goes. Yeah. I guess. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time and for all the art you showed. Oh, they were all fantastic. Yeah, I didn't mean to turn. I don't know your... if I've seen all of those, so that was awesome. <laughs> I warned you I had a lot of art to show. So I love it. <laughs> and we didn't get to see all of it. I'm sorry. Oh man. No, you're good. You're good. But uh, yeah, if you guys like this content, please consider subscribing, liking, and ringing that notification bell so you're notified whenever we have another episode uh, that goes live. Thank you again so much for watching, and until next time, guys, keep, keep it nerdy. It nerdy. nerdy. <laughs>